Opening words are from the book, My Grandmother's Hands, Racialized Trauma, and the Pathway to Mending Our Hearts and Bodies by Resma Menicum. When I was a boy, I used to watch television with my grandmother. I would sit in the middle of the sofa and she would stretch out over two seats, resting her legs in my lap. She often felt pain in her hands and she'd ask me to rub them in mine. When I did, her fingers would relax and she'd smile. Sometimes she'd start to hum melodically and her voice would make a vibration that reminded me of a cat's purr. She wasn't a large woman, but her hands were surprisingly stout with broad fingers and thick pads below each thumb. One day I asked her, Grandma, why are your hands like that? They ain't the same as mine. My grandmother turned from the television and looked at me. Boy, she said slowly, that's from picking cotton. They've been that way since long before I was your age. I started working in the fields sharecropping when I was four. The cotton plant has pointed burrs in it. When you reach your hand in, the burrs rip it up. When I first started picking, my hands were all torn and bloody. When I got older, they got thicker and thicker until I could reach in and pull out the cotton without them bleeding. My grandmother died last year. Sometimes I can still feel her warm, thick hands in mine. I would like to invite Carol Hawkins up to light our chalice this morning, please, as I read the words of Reverend Julianne Lepp. We seek our place in the world and the answer to our heart's deep questions. As we seek, may our hearts be open to unexpected answers. May the light of our chalice remind us this is a community of warmth, of wisdom and welcoming of multiple truths. Thank you, Carol. Well, good morning. Good morning. I'm Donna Zimmerman. I'm your worship associate for today, and my pronouns are she and her. Welcome to our members and friends who are here with us today, and I extend a very special welcome to those who are visiting. We are truly glad you found your way here. We are still observing some modified precautions at the time. However, when our worship ends, we invite you to enjoy the fresh air and beautiful day and visit with your friends outside. Now see how I snuck that in? A subtle way of getting you to exit the building right <laughs> after the service by extolling the merits of the sunshine. 
But wait, there's more. To further entice you, we are returning to offering very light refreshments outside. Our church leadership continues to monitor the needed safety protocols and to make changes. So for now, we're still wearing the mask. We're still having no communal singing, but light refreshments outside. You probably didn't hear anything except light refreshments. And now we will go to our time for all ages. Hello and welcome to our Wonder Box. Today we have something really interesting in the box. Can you guess what? A lizard. Why a lizard? Well, I want to share some lessons I've learned about lizard taming. These are adapted from Resma Minicum. I learned from reading his book, In My Grandmother's Hands, that your brain is made up of different parts. The front part up here is what allows us to have language and memories and thoughts. The part back here is more like the brain of lots of other kinds of animals. And so sometimes it gets called the lizard brain. Most animals, like lizards, don't really think about how they're going to respond. Rather, they respond instinctually by doing something that helps them survive. Finding food, running away, making friends, fighting off something dangerous. So we have a little lizard brain inside of our brains and it looks at all the information our bodies take in. And if it decides that something is really dangerous, it makes us try to fight, flee, befriend, or freeze in fear before our thinking brain even has a chance to think about what happened. And sometimes the lizard gets it wrong. We feel really scared about something that isn't all that scary. People may try to tell us not to be scared, but the lizard isn't listening. It's making us scared anyway. So we're going to learn some tools right now to tame your lizard. The first tool is swaying. So I'll, let's practice this. Let's get comfortable and take a few slow, deep breaths together. Are you ready? Let's breathe in. in then slowly I want you to rock your upper body from side to side or forward and back if you like you could hum a slow soothing tune and rock to its beat Feel free to experiment with standing versus sitting, with rocking side to side versus forward and back, with a range of different but always slow speeds. You could even try sitting in a variety of seats and positions. Discover what feels best to your body. So let's just take a moment and sway. You ready? Everybody sway. When you're done, stop and notice what your body is experiencing. You can also keep your body still, but let your head and neck rock slowly from side to side. Our second tool is belly breathing. Again, you get comfortable and you take a few deep breaths. Let your shoulders relax. And place your palm on the center of your belly 
just above your navel. Press in gently. Hold your hand in place for a moment or two. Then slowly rub your belly for three to four minutes or whatever way feels good to your body. Let's do that just for a moment. Let's rub our bellies. When you're done, pay attention to the sensations in your body. Focus your attention on the center of your belly, behind your navel. Breathe in and out, deeply and slowly a few times. Let's do that. Pull all the air all the way down into your belly. Keep breathing deeply and slowly. Follow your breath as it flows in through your nose, down your throat, through your lungs, and into your belly. Keep following it as it flows back out again. You won't actually pull air into your belly, of course, but it will feel that way. Continue breathing. Stop and notice what you experience in your body. What are you feeling? Both of these tools help us to calm our lizard brain and to come back to our center when it has gotten something wrong and things aren't as scary as they might seem. I want you to remember to just sway and breathe. And with this, our lesson is told. Until the next time. And now I would like to introduce Pete Jorgensen, who will play the piano for us.
so much, Pete. That was great. Mm -hmm. Reverend Carmen Emerson is BBUUC's affiliated community minister. That means that while she's affiliated with BBUUC and provides mentoring to our Healthy Congregation team and offers leadership development workshops, her full-time ministry is in the community. Reverend Carmen is the staff chaplain at Baptist Nassau Medical Center in Fernandina Beach. I would like to invite Reverend Carmen Emerson to the pulpit to lead us in a centering exercise. So Reverend Amy sent out an email asking if people were familiar with the book My Grandmother's Hands by Resma Menachem. It's cracking me up because Chris and Amy and I are all saying the name a different way, so I don't know. But I told her that our spiritual care department at Baptist, our diversity, equity, and inclusion team is working through this book um, as a way to address um, just looking deep at racism that we carry, trauma that we carry in our bodies, um, from racism, white bodies and black bodies carry this trauma. So I have a quick reading um, because I'm going to do a body practice with us, but there's some terms that are important for you to understand before we go to the body practice. So here's the first part. Our bodies have a form of knowledge that is different from our cognitive brains. This knowledge is typically experienced as a felt sense of constriction or expansion pain or ease, energy or numbness. Often this knowledge is stored in our bodies as wordless stories about what is safe and what is dangerous. The body is where we fear, hope and react, where we constrict and release, and where we reflexively fight, flee or freeze. Part of that that's stored in our body, Menachem refers to what happens in our body and those experiences in our body as working through dirty pain and clean pain. And I know you're going to hear that in Reverend Amy's sermon, so I want to give you a heads up about what those things mean. Clean pain is pain that mends and you can build your capacity for growth. It's the pain you experience when you know exactly what you need to do or say, when you really, really don't want to say or do it, and when you do it anyway. It's also the pain you experience when you have no idea what to do, when you're scared or worried about what might happen, and when you step forward into the unknown anyway with honesty and vulnerability. That's clean pain. It's the pain of growth and mending. Dirty pain is the pain of avoidance and blame and denial. When people respond from our most wounded parts, become cruel or violent, or physically or emotionally run away, they experience dirty pain. They also create more of it for themselves and others. So just with that context, I want to lead you in um, a body-centered practice. And so I invite you, um, us UUs who love to live in our heads, to come down into our bodies a little bit more this morning. And I invite you to do your best not to be self-conscious about this. Just relax into your body. Take a moment to ground yourself in your own body. Notice the outline of your skin and the slight pressure of the air around it. Experience the firmer pressure of the chair beneath you, the floor beneath your feet. Can you sense hope in your body? Where? How does your body experience that hope? Is it a release or expansion? A tightening born of eagerness or anticipation? What specific hopes accompany these sensations? The chance to heal, to be free of the burden of racialized trauma, to live a bigger, deeper life.
Do you experience any fear in your body? If so, where? How does it manifest as tightness, as a painful radiance, as a dead hard spot? What worries accompany that fear? Are you afraid your life will be different in ways that you cannot predict? Are you afraid of facing clean pain? Are you worried you will choose dirty pain instead? Do you feel the raw, wordless fear and perhaps excitement that heralds change? What pictures appear in your mind as you experience that fear? If your body feels both hopeful and afraid, congratulations. You're just where you need to be for what comes next. Well, if you've been following the order of service, you see uh, what I'm going to refer to as uh, a mistake. And when you make a mistake, I believe people either hide it or highlight it. Since I don't believe in hiding, um, I'm apparently missing some of my pages up here, or I have them out of order or something. So we had the wonderful transition to Reverend Carmen's body-centered exercise, but I completely skipped over the commissioning service for um, pastoral care. So I believe that's the next thing that's supposed to come up, and I will leave it to our tech team. I just got the high sign. So thank you for allowing me to highlight my mistake. <laughs> The members of the pastoral care team at BBUUC offer a sustained, caring presence for members of the community who are experiencing grief, crises, and stressful transitions. The pastoral care team is committed to caring for and supporting people so that no one has to feel alone. Today, we commission a new member of the pastoral care team and a returning member of the team. We commission Elizabeth Deku as animal chaplain at BBUUC. Elizabeth has been certified as a Unitarian Universalist animal chaplain after completing a joint program of the Association for Veterinary Pastoral Education and the Unitarian Universalist Animal Ministry. She dedicated that training to the memory of Reverend Liz Teal, who had a similar ministry for many years. Elizabeth is available to BBUUC members who have pastoral care needs related to animals in areas such as grief support, celebration of life, and blessing of animals. She facilitates an animal grief support group here at BBUUC. Lee Plum has been a member of the pastoral care team in the past, and she recently rejoined the team. Lee is also completing training to become certified as a death doula. Elizabeth and Lee. As the minister of Buckman Bridge Unitarian Universalist Church, I am grateful for your willingness to serve in your role. 
As pastoral care team members, I charge you to be caring listeners to your fellow parishioners, to sit with them in their pain and celebrate with them in their joy. I charge you to care for yourselves and one another, to be generous in spirit and to ask for help when you need it. May you know that your care is powerful. May you know that I am here to guide and support you. And may you know that you are enough. As your minister and as your congregation, we commission you as our pastoral care team members. Thank you for all you will give. And let's all show our gratitude for Elizabeth and Lee. Thank you both very much for your caring ministry. I know it comes from your hearts. Generosity is one of the spiritual values we recognize as central to our personal and our institutional well being. Besides the practical aspect that any institution needs financial support to thrive, the act of giving has meaning because this is something that we do individually and we do it together. Your support shows that we put our money where our values are. Thank you for your faithful support of your pledge commitment for the continuation of our ministries within our congregation and to the community. In the interest of safety, we are not passing the plate for now. However, you may drop your donation in one of the two donation boxes at the back of the church. You may also go to the church's website and click on the donate link at the top of the page. No matter how you give, I thank you for participating in this ritual of generosity. We have been greatly blessed. Now let us in turn be a blessing. When I look at the worship calendar for the year, I try to plan a variety of different kinds of worship services. Some explore Unitarian Universalist history and theology and how they're relevant to our contemporary lives. Some services explore topics of social justice and the work of dismantling oppression in our communities. Some services are more pastoral, where we acknowledge the pain and heartbreak that are part of the experience of being human, and we consider how to support one another in moving towards healing and wholeness. When I was planning this worship service, I knew I wanted to do a pastoral service. I wanted to offer an opportunity for all of us to check in with our emotions. I also knew that the Soul Matters theme for the month is widening the circle. Widening the circle refers to helping Unitarian Universalist communities be more welcoming to and inclusive of people with marginalized identities. It's a theme that invites all of us to dismantle oppressions based on race, class, ability and disability, LGBTQIA identity, and more. So I wondered, how can I address widening the circle and tending to our emotional lives? I didn't know, so I asked some of my colleagues. One of them told me about the book, My Grandmother's Hands, Racialized Trauma and the Pathway to Mending Our Hearts and Bodies, written by Resma Menicum. I had heard of this book. Does it ever happen to you that you keep hearing about a book from different people? I had heard the book recommended in Facebook groups and at minister gatherings for probably the past two years. This seemed like finally the right time to start reading it. As Unitarian Universalists, 
we are committed to an ongoing search for truth and meaning in our lives. We are, com we are a community of seekers, constantly looking for greater understanding of the world around us and deeper meaning and purpose in our own lives. We affirm six sources that we draw on in our search for truth. I wanna share two of them today with you. The second source is words and deeds of prophetic people, which challenge, challenge us to confront powers and structures of evil with justice, compassion, and the transforming power of love. And the fifth source is humanist teachings, which counsel us to heed the guidance of reason and the results of science and warn us against idolatries of the mind and spirit. Resma Menekin is a prophetic voice calling us to confront the evil of racism by healing the impacts of trauma in our bodies and creating more space and freedom for all of us. He grounds his work in the science of psychobiology, which deals with the biological basis of behavior and mental phenomena. As I learned about the ideas presented in my grandmother's hands, I was engaged in my own search for truth and meaning. Exploring these ideas is an opportunity to draw on wisdom from our second and fifth sources. Although I thought I wanted to do a service that invites us into our emotions, it turns out the book is focused on how we can better pay attention to our bodies. My free and responsible search for truth and meaning took me into a very interesting exploration of our lizard brain, our fight, flight, and freeze responses, trauma, and practices that can help us feel more grounded and settled in our bodies. In the book, Menachem explains that people have spent a lot of time thinking and talking about the problems of racism and white supremacy in hopes of solving these problems. But thinking and talking about these things is not going to get us there. Menachem argues that we need to examine how white supremacy operates in our bodies in order to be able to heal from the wounds of racism in the United States. We need to understand how living in a society where white lives are valued more highly than the lives of people of color impacts our bodies and our nervous systems. We've tried really hard to teach our brains to do better on issues of racism, but we need to teach our bodies too. We need to heal the soul wound of racism. Menachem writes this, quote, we need to begin with the healing of trauma in dark skinned bodies, light skinned bodies, our neighborhoods and communities and the law enforcement profession. Social and political actions are essential, but they need to be part of a larger strategy of healing justice and creating room for growth in traumatized flesh and blood bodies." Unquote. In his book, Menachem uses the term white body supremacy. It was the first time I had heard this term. I was familiar with the term white supremacy, which I understand to mean systems and practices that benefit white people and exclude people of color. So why does Menachem use the term white body supremacy? He uses the term because he's interested in how systems of white supremacy operate in our bodies. He emphasizes that the white body has become the standard by which all bodies are measured. And he uses the term because, quote, every white skinned body, no matter who inhabits it, and no matter what they think, believe, do or say, automatically benefits from it, unquote. Menachem writes about how our brains work, how our brains are connected to our bodies and how trauma affects our brains and our bodies. He explains that our most powerful emotions, such as love, fear, hope, and anger, involve the activation of something called the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve is a cranial nerve that connects the brain to the body. 
and it's connected to that lizard brain that Chris told us about this morning. Minikin also calls the vagus nerve the soul nerve. The technical term for the lizard brain is the amygdala. The amygdala is responsible for the impulse to go into fight, flight, or freeze mode when we sense danger. It's hardwired to take over when it senses danger. It responds the same way when we experience a real threat and a perceived threat. The amygdala sends a message to the nervous system, which directs the body's rapid involuntary responses of flight, fight, or flee, or freeze. As Chris explained in the story this morning, sometimes our lizard brains get it wrong. We respond with an urge to fight, flee, or freeze when there's not actually any real danger present. We can use tools of mindfulness, deep breathing, and more to remind ourselves that we are safe and to shift into relaxation. So how does all of this relate to trauma? How does trauma impact the urge to fight, flight, or flee? Trauma is the body's response to a distressing event that overwhelms a person's ability to cope. It's a protective mechanism designed to stop potential harm to body and mind. When a person experiences a traumatic event, their fight, flight, or freeze response is triggered. If the person is not then able to metabolize that energy that was triggered and heal from it, it becomes stuck in their nervous system, in their body. This can result in the person having outsized reactions to small events. A trauma response can look like a person reacting to a small problem as though it is a life or death situation. Trauma can be passed from person to person and from generation to generation. This happens in family where there is abuse and mistreatment. It happens in unsafe and abusive systems, structures, and institutions. And it happens in our genes. Trauma can be passed through our DNA. In his book, Menachem offers a guide for healing trauma for people of all races. He acknowledges that healing these wounds is painful. He distinguishes between two different kinds of pain, clean and dirty pain. Clean pain is pain that mends and builds a person's capacity for growth. It's the discomfort you feel when you know you need to have a really hard conversation and you feel nervous about it, but you find the courage to do it anyway. Experiencing clean pain builds resilience. Dirty pain is pain of avoidance, blame, or denial. It's the pain you feel when you respond to a situation from your most wounded self. Healing trauma involves recognizing, accepting, and moving through pain, through clean pain. Resma Menachem explains how the trauma of white body supremacy impacts black and white Americans differently. In this section of the book, he does not address, directly address people of color who are not black. I'm sorry, I am also not able to address that experience directly today, but I hope his insights are still helpful to everyone who's listening. I'm gonna share with you a pretty long quote about this because I think it's important that we hear his words as he has written them on this topic. <clears throat> Here's what he says. This book is about the body, your body. If you're African-American, in this book, you'll explore the trauma that is likely internalized and embedded in it. You'll see how multiple forces, genes, history, culture, laws, and family have created a long bloodline of trauma in African-American bodies. It doesn't mean we're defective. In fact, it means just the opposite. Something happened to us, something we can heal from. We survived because of our resilience, which was also passed down from one generation to the next. This book presents some profound opportunities for healing and growth. Some of these are communal healing practices our Afri African-American and African ancestors 
developed, and adapted. Others are more recent creations. All of these practices foster resilience in our bodies and plasticity in our brains. We'll use these practices to recognize the trauma in our own bodies, to touch it, heal it, and grow out of it, and to create more room for growth in our nervous systems. <clears throat> White body supremacy also harms people who do not have dark skin. If you are a white American, your body has probably inherited a different legacy of trauma that affects white bodies and at times may rekindle old fight, flee, or freeze responses. This trauma goes back centuries, at least as far back as the Middle Ages, and has been passed down from one white body to another for dozens of generations. White bodies traumatized each other in Europe for centuries before they encountered black and red bodies. This carnage and trauma profoundly affected white bodies and the expression of their DNA. As we'll see, this historical trauma is closely linked to the development of white body supremacy in America. If you are a white American, this book will offer you a wealth of practices for mending this trauma in your own body, growing beyond it and creating more room in your own nervous system. I urge you to take this responsibility seriously. As you'll discover, it will help create greater freedom and serenity for all of us." Unquote. Now, let's all take a deep breath. I've just shared a lot of information with you. Information about how our brains and bodies work, about the impact of trauma on our brains and our bodies. And I've introduced a new way of looking at and understanding racism in the United States. It's a lot to take in, and uh, I've only covered chapter one at this point. I hope I have been able to share some of Medicum's ideas with you in a way that makes sense. I hope some of the information has been helpful to you in thinking about how we approach issues of race and racism as a community. Please know that I have only scratched the surface of the ideas presented in this very rich text. I have spent a lot of time, as Medicum describes, thinking and talking and using my intellect to try to understand issues of race and racism. I have tried so hard with my intellect to do better and efforts to dismantle racism. But I hadn't really considered how I can work to heal the wounds of racism in my own body, in my own nervous system. This was a huge revelation for me. I am really looking forward to continuing to dive into this work and exploring all of these ideas further. I am hopeful that these ideas can strengthen the work of racial justice that Unitarian Universalists are currently engaged in. I look forward to engaging with you in our shared search for truth and meaning as we explore how we can widen the circle of love and inclusion in our Unitarian Universalist communities. May we find ways of being in community together that support all people in their searches for truth and meaning. May we come together to mend our hearts and our bodies and be a part of healing the world. May it be so. Amen. Please welcome Pete Jorgensen to play some more very special music.
Our closing words are written by Jim Wickman. May our faith sustain us, our hope inspire us, and our love surround us as we go our separate ways, knowing that we will gather again in this beloved community. Amen. As we extinguish this flame, may we remember we never walk out into the world alone. We stand on the shoulders of brave and generous ones who have gone before. We walk beside companions, ready to catch us when we fall. We hold our memories of dear ones in our hearts who keep us connected to our center. May we make this our most important work to remember that who we are does not end at the edges of our own skin. Our worship has ended now. Let our service begin. <laughs>